We know a lot about how things that happen in Europe shape things that happen in the Americas. We think about political developments in Europe and migration from Europe. We think about European wars and their shaping influence on American history. But we have very little sense of all of the history in Africa that then plays itself out in the Americas. I come from an old Chesapeake family, a family that's been in Virginia and its area for, for a very long time, maybe as far back as the 17th century. So I kind of have a deep sense of the black history of the United States and of North America. So that inspired a certain kind of curiosity in me about where we came from, kind of what these stories are. When I was in high school and college, I actually thought I was going to go into theater. I was from Southern California, so I spent some time auditioning in LA. And I think I learned pretty quickly that it was going to be difficult for me to work in an industry where I wasn't able to write my own roles. The kind of parts that were available, especially to black actors uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, were not parts that I was well suited to. The parts that they wanted were what they called urban parts, and that wasn't my experience. And so while I think I was a good enough trained actor, I could have, I could have portrayed that. I didn't think that those were the roles that I wanted to portray, that I wanted to play. And so I went into a business where I thought I could write my own history. I don't think there are a lot of people who read history that deeply. They may know a few stories that are repeated over and over and over again. They know a few iconic historical figures like your George Washingtons and your Thomas Jeffersons, hopefully now your Harriet Tubmans. But for the most part, there are these events that are more obscure despite the fact that they were hugely important at the time. A lot of people don't know that there weren't just 13 British American colonies, there were 26. And by far the most profitable, most militarily significant, best politically connected of those colonies were those colonies in the Caribbean. And Jamaica was Great Britain's most profitable colony on the eve of the American Revolution. So when we see a major slave revolt happening in 1760 in Great Britain's most important colony, we're seeing one of the most important things that happened in the history of America up to that point. What I wanted was to connect up what's happening in Africa, what's happening in the Caribbean, what's happening in North America, what's happening in Europe, all within this one story. And what I settled on was the best way to tell the story was to tell it as a story of movement, to tell it as a story of the trajectory of all of these people who were involved in the slave revolt and follow them around from Europe to Africa, to North America, and through the Caribbean. Tacky's Revolt is about the largest slave revolt in the 18th century British Empire, which occurred in Jamaica in 1760 and went on into 1761. It's not very well known outside of Jamaica itself, even though it was in part in reaction to Tacky's Revolt that many people thought slavery is a dangerous enterprise for empires to be engaged in. And that in some ways gave an early impetus to the abolitionist movement in the Anglo-Atlantic world. It's really difficult to do black history at times, in part because to the extent that our history emerges from the history of slavery, the records that record the history of slavery are not records in large part produced by black people. Black people we find in the records of slave societies on property lists. They're there listed alongside the cows and the pigs and the sheep on plantations. We don't have a number of diaries from enslaved people, for example. We have the diaries of overseers. And so when people hear the word slavery and slave, they tend to think about a slave as merely an extension of a slaveholder's will. That's the idea of a slave from the perspective of slaveholders. And it tends to obscure the intentions of the people who were enslaved. It tends to obscure their histories. It tends to obscure their desires. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do here is you know, write about the history of the enslaved more than the history of slavery as an institution. Edward Long, a historian and Jamaican planter, wrote about Tacky's Revolt in his 1774 three-volume history of Jamaica. But of course, he was someone who experienced the revolt firsthand. He's someone who hated Africans, uh, was definitely not in favor of the revolt, uh, and he was a slave owner himself. 
And so I thought that we needed a kind of an account that wasn't largely based on his account, which is one of the reasons I went into so much detail on the revolt is because I was in some ways trying to revise, trying to replace this account from Edward Long in 1774. It was important to go into that level of detail in some ways to honor the actions of those people who are not usually honored with that level of detail in the description of their history. I wanted to have a blow-by-blow -blow account of this slave revolt, and so I thought that by putting those on the landscape, taking everything I learned and plotting it on a map and a timeline, I could discern why people move the way they did, why they move through the landscape in particular ways. And that's one of the things that I was able to do by really identifying every location that was listed in my sources. Arthur Forrest, who was a captain in the British Royal Navy, owned one of the principal leaders of the 1760 slave revolt. And we know from these property records that he owned 650 acres in the parish of Westmoreland where Wager started that revolt. So we know from one of these maps where Forest Plantation was in Westmoreland. We know it was called Maze Muir. And then we see that Maze Muir was just down the hills from what's listed here as the Rebels Barricade. On this topographical map, we can see that the Rebels Barricade was just up in this detached mountain range here. And you can see that they thought this detached mountain range here would be defensible. One of the things I'm trying to do is add to our collective store of stories about the past, um, about the past that's relevant to us. And to the extent that we think that the history of freedom is relevant to us, the history of slave revolt has to be relevant to us. And we certainly can understand the history of freedom if we're not understanding the history of slaves who were rebelling for their freedom. <laughs>